Uh, today I'm reading classic fairy tales, Puss in Boots. A certain miller had three sons, and when he died, the only worldly goods that he had left to them were his mill, his donkey, and his cat. This little legacy was very quickly divided up. The eldest son took the mill, and the second son took the donkey. All that remained for the youngest son was the cat, and he was very disappointed to receive such a miserable portion. My brothers, he said, will be able to get a decent living by joining forces, but for my part, as soon as I have eaten my cat and made a fur cap out of his skin, I am bound to die of hunger. These remarks were overheard by Puss, who pretended to not have been listening, and who said very somberly and seriously, there is not the least need for you to worry, master. All you have to do is give me a pouch and get a pair of boots made for me so that I can walk around in the woods. You will find that your share is not so bad after all. Now this cat had often shown himself capable of performing clever tricks. When catching rats and mice, for example, he would hide himself nearby their food and hang downward by the feet as though he were dead. His master, therefore, though he did not build too much on what the cat had said, felt some hope of being assisted in his miserable plight. When his master gave Puss the pair of boots that he had asked for, Puss gaily pulled them on. Then Puss hung the pouch around his neck, holding the cords that tied in front of him with his paws. He went into a warren where a great number of rabbits lived. Placing some bran and lettuce in the pouch, he stretched himself out and lay as if he were dead. His plan was to wait until some young rabbit, unlearned in worldly wisdom, should come and rummage in the pouch for the food that Puss had placed there. Hardly had he laid himself down when things began to happen as he wished. A stupid young rabbit went into the pouch and Puss, pulling the cords tight, caught him in an instant. Well satisfied with his capture, Puss departed to the king's palace. There he demanded an audience and was ushered upstairs. He entered the royal apartment and bowed deep before the king. I bring you, sire, he said, a rabbit from the warren of the Marquis of Carabas, which was the title he invented for his master. He asked me to present this to you on his behalf. Tell your master, replied the king, that I thank him and I am pleased by his attention. Another time, the cat hid himself in a wheat field with the mouth of his bag wide open. Two partridges ventured in and by pulling the cords tight, he captured both of them. Off he went and presented them to the king, just as he had done with the rabbit from the warren. His majesty was even more pleased by the pairing of partridges and handed the cat a present for himself. For two or three months, Puss went on in the same way, every now and again presenting to the king a gift from his master and some type of new game he had caught. There soon came a day when Puss learned that the king intended to take his young daughter, who was the most beautiful princess in the world, for a carriage ride along the river bank. If you will do as I tell you, said Puss to his master, your fortune will be made. You have to only go and bathe in the river at the spot that I point to you. Leave the rest to me. His master had no idea what the cat was planning, but he did just as Puss directed. While he was bathing, the king drew near and Puss once again began to cry out at the top of his voice. Help, help, the Marquis of Carabas is drowning. When he heard the shouts, the king stuck his head out of the carriage window. He recognized the cat who had so often brought him gifts, and he asked the guards to go immediately to help the Marquis of Carabas. While the guards were pulling the poor Marquis out of the river, Puss approached the carriage and explained to the king that while his master was bathing, robbers had taken away his clothes, although he cried stop thief at the top of his voice. But as a matter of fact, the clever cat had hidden the clothes under a big stone. The king at once commanded the keepers of his wardrobe to select a suit of his finest clothes for the Marquis of Carabas. The king greeted the Marquis with many compliments, and as the fine clothes that the Marquis had just put on made him look like a gentleman and set off his good looks, the king's daughter found him very much to her liking. Indeed, the Marquis of Carabas had not cast more than two or three tender glances upon her when the princess fell madly in love with him. The king then invited the Marquis to get in the coach and ride with them. Delighted to see that his plan was beginning to work so successfully, the clever cat went ahead of the coach. Soon he came upon a group of peasants who were mowing a field of wheat. Listen, my good fellows, he said, if you do not tell the king 
that the field you're mowing belongs to the Marquis of Carabas, you will all be chopped up into little pieces like mince meat. Soon the king arrived and he asked the mowers who owned the field on which they were working. It is the property of the Marquis of Carabas, they all cried in one voice, for a threat from the puss had frightened them terribly. You have inherited a fine estate, the king said to the Marquis. As for yourself, sire, he replied, this is a meadow that never fails to yield an abundant crop each year. Still traveling ahead of the others, Puss came upon some harvesters. Listen, my good fellows, if you do not declare that every one of these fields belongs to the Marquis of Carabas, you will all be chopped into little bits like mince meat. The king came by a moment later and wished to know who owned the fields that he saw before him. It is the Marquis of Carabas, cried the harvesters, and the king was more pleased than ever. And the king was more pleased than ever with the Marquis, and he complimented him on his many noble possessions. Traveling ahead of the coach, Puss made the same threat to all the people he met. The king was astonished at all the great wealth of the Marquis. Finally, Puss reached a splendid castle that belonged to a giant ogre. The cat had taken care to learn everything he could about the ogre and what powers he possessed. Puss now asked to speak with the ogre, saying that he did not wish to pass so close to the castle without having the honor of paying his respects to the owner. Puss entered a large room where the ogre received him as politely as an ogre could and invited Puss to sit down. I have been told, said Puss, that you have the power to change yourself into any kind of animal that you would like to. For example, I have heard that you can transform yourself into a lion or an elephant. That is perfectly true, said the ogre sternly, and just to prove it, I will immediately turn into a lion. Puss was so frightened to suddenly find himself so close to a lion that he sprang away and climbed onto the roof of the castle, but not without much difficulty and danger, for his boots were not well suited for walking on roof tiles. Some time later, when the cat saw that the ogre had changed himself back from a lion, Puss climbed down from the roof, admitting that he had been indeed very frightened. I have also been told, Puss said to the ogre, but I can scarcely believe it, that you have the power to take shape of even smaller animals, that you can change yourself into a rat or a mouse. For example, I must confess that to me that seems quite impossible. Impossible, cried the ogre? Well, you shall see right away. And at that very instant, the ogre changed himself into a small mouse, and he began to run around on the floor to every corner of the room. No sooner did Puss see the tiny mouse that he pounced on it and ate it. In the meantime, the king came along, admiring the ogre's beautiful estate, ordered the coachman to drive up to the gate as he wished to visit the castle. The cat had heard the rumble of the coach as it crossed the castle drawbridge, and running onto the courtyard, he cried, Welcome, your majesty, to the castle of the Marquis of Carabas. What's that? cried the king. Is this splendid castle also yours, Marquis? I have never seen anything more grand than this building and courtyard and the grounds around it. No doubt the castle itself is just as magnificent on the inside. With your permission, Marquis, may we go inside and look around? The Marquis gave his hand to the young princess as she stepped out of the coach, and followed by the king, they led the way up to the great staircase. As they entered the large hall, they found there a magnificent feast that had been prepared by the ogre for some friends who were to pay him a visit that very day. When these guests heard that the king, the princess, and the great marquis were already inside the castle, they did not dare to enter, and instead they turned away and left. The king was now quite charmed with the excellent qualities and the great wealth of the marquis of Carabas, and the young princess was also completely captivated by him. In fact, she had fallen deeply in love with him. When they had finished eating the great feast, the king and the princess were quite satisfied with the banquet. The king turned to the marquis and said, it will be your own fault, Marquis of Carabas, if you do not soon become my son-in-law. The Marquis, bowing very low, with a thousand expressions of gratitude and respect, accepted the great honor the king had bestowed upon him. That very same day, the Marquis married the princess, and everyone celebrated with another grand feast. The princess and the Marquis made much of Puss, who was treated as a guest of honor at the wedding table. The Marquis promised Puss a comfortable life at the castle for the rest of his life, Puss became a personage of great importance and gave up hunting mice, except for his own amusement. The end.